please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. First of all, uh, I'm a feminist. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi is uh, an inspiration and should be an inspiration to us all. Feminism, protectionism, immigration and cricket. He said, well, he can play the game, but not that well. The Internet's favorite global leader, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, spoke about all this and more at a town hall at IIM Ahmedabad today. Good evening. Thanks very much for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Ronaja. Ashmit Kumar also joins me from the Delhi studio. We'll be bringing you more from that interesting conversation Shireen had with him at IIM Ahmedabad up ahead on the show. But first, let's get you up to speed with the top story that we are tracking this evening. We broke the news on Friday evening and now the confirmation has come none other than from the horse's mouth. TV Narendran, the managing director and CEO of Tata Steel has confirmed to CNBC TV 18 that the steel major has bid for Bhushan Steel, the biggest bankruptcy so far to go under the hammer. Narendran spoke exclusively with my colleague. He, however, as expectedly, refused to comment on the exact bid amount. Remember, we told you last Friday that Tata Steel has pipped JSW Group to emerge as the highest bidder for the cash trap company Bhushan Steel. In fact, Bush and Steel stock sold nearly 20% in trade. How often do you see that? After the company informed the exchanges that Tata Steel, JSW Steel and a consortium of the company's own employees have submitted their bids to take over its assets. It's not just Tata Steel. We also caught up with the other key stakeholder, Sajan Jindal of the JSW Group. He told us that while they could not match Tata's bid for Bush and Steel, they will continue to look for more stressed assets. Not just that, Neeraj uh, Singhal, the managing director of Bhushan Steel, was also on the channel speaking with CNBC TV 18. He explained the rationale behind the employees' surprising bid for Bhushan Steel. Take a look. What made uh, Tata Steel offer more than earlier? It is quite 40% uh, uh, above the first uh, bid that you had put in for Bhushan Steel. I don't think there's any first bid and later bid. I think the media have talked of num uh, multiple numbers. So I don't want to comment on the specific numbers, but uh, uh, you know, we'll wait to hear from the IRP and then we will come in. But yes, uh, these assets, we uh, have been interested right from the beginning because uh, they're in the eastern region and uh, we believe that there's a lot of synergy we can get out of these assets. And uh, will the payment be upfront or staggered in how many years? <laughs> I won't comment on that. Uh, there is a, we've submitted a bid. Uh, there are many details in the bid. I wouldn't like to comment on that till we have a formal discussion with the IRP. By when do you expect uh, formalization? I don't know. I think uh, we were told that we may hear something this week, so we'll wait for that. Sir, and if you, we talk about, you know, your bidding for distressed assets, uh, what is it right now that you are uh, looking forward to? Well, there are lots of assets in steel and uh, uh, steel and power and infrastructure. So these are whatever comes in falls in our our area. Sir, but Tata's have outbid you both on power and Bhushan uh, assets. In uh, steel, so, yeah, in yeah. Bhushan steel and Bhushan power. Yeah. So do you think you were not aggressive enough there? No, no, we were quite aggressive, but they were much more aggressive than us. Would you be Man, just happy to be us. with uh, Monet uh, assets right now? And, and uh, we, we, we will have to. Uh, be satisfied with that. So problem. what would be your next stage of expansions be, sir? Uh, we'll see that. Uh, I mean, I can't uh, right now. I don't know. But, uh, but next phase we will see. Employees have a lot of sentimental value for the company. And since they built it and it's... Uh, so they put in a bid and uh, I think it could be a good bid. And it could be, they've offered a lot of uh, equity to the uh, banks, which I think it's a good uh, move. Uh, seeing the upturn in the steel industry, which is going to happen, uh, and it is happening, and uh, in the last six to eight months, uh, about 10,000 rupees has uh, the prices of in steel industry has gone up. And going forward, uh, even globally, uh, since China is uh, uh, cutting their production uh, because of various reasons, environmental and so on. Uh, the steel industry will, uh, I feel, will do well now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the bank should uh, have the benefit of the upturn also now. 
Right, so Tata Steel there emerging as the front runner. As far as uh, market wasn't thoroughly impressed, uh, Tata Steel down nearly 6% in today's trade. Uh, let's shift focus now. Uh, while the government and various regulatory bodies deal with the administrative and regulatory fallout of the 11,000 crore rupee fraud at Punjab National Bank, investigative agencies have been busy digging deeper into the mechanics of the fraud and the money train involved. In fact, the CBI has sealed the Brady House branch of the PNB and continues to question three people arrested over the weekend in connection with the fraud, including two bank officials. The, the enforcement directorate, meanwhile, has continued with its search and seizure operations across various properties linked to Nirav Modi, his family, his group entities, Gitanjali Gems and Mehul Choksi. Uh, CNBC TV 18's Timzi Jaipuria and Arundhati Ramanan do a status check on the investigative action that's taken place on day five. This is the Brady House branch of Punjab National Bank, which is at the center of the 11,400 crore rupee fraud that came to light in mid-February. This has now been sealed by the CBI as part of its ongoing investigation into the fraud. But the CBI is not the only investigative agency that's busy following the money trail and unearthing evidence pertaining to the fraud. The Enforcement Directorate, which is conducting an independent parallel investigation, has been busy conducting search and seizure operations at various locations across the country since the fraud first came to light. On the 16th of February, a written report from the Ministry of Finance to the Prime Minister's office, which CNBC TV18 saw, said that the Enforcement Directorate had, over the preceding 48 hours, conducted search operations at 52 locations across 11 states. In the course of these operations, ED officials seized movable property, including jewellery, totaling over 5,600 crore rupees. These operations continued through the weekend and are still ongoing. So Monday, the 19th of February, marks the fifth day of search and seizure operations. Well, sources tell us that on the fifth day of its investigations, the Enforcement Directorate continued the search and seizure operations at 39 locations across India. In the cases of uh, Nirav Modi, Mehul Choksi, Gitanjali Gems and other Nirav Modi's companies. Well, with today's investigations and seizures, uh, the ED today seized assets worth 22 crore rupees, which takes the total to about 5,716 crore rupees worth of total. Total seizure. The Revenue Department, meanwhile, has been conducting its own parallel investigation. Sources say the department has detected several transactions totaling 556 crore rupees, which have seen unexplained cash being sent abroad by Nirav Modi. In connection with these transactions, the department has approached tax authorities in Bahamas, Singapore, Jersey and Cyprus. It has also asked these authorities for details of various trusts and companies floated by Nirav Modi in these jurisdictions. For instance, sources say the department has asked for more details on several transactions totaling 271 crore rupees. We learned that these involve Nirav Modi's firm Firestar International Private Limited receiving money from Singapore-based Islington International Holdings. Officials say the source of these funds remains suspicious and unexplained. Similarly, the Revenue Department is learned to have uncovered transactions to the tune of 284 crore rupees in which Firestar received funds from Jade Bridge Holdings of Cyprus and Forcom Worldwide Investment Limited of Mauritius. The Revenue Department has also detected several bank accounts with unexplained share transfer transactions. It also suspects, sources say, that Nirav Modi conducted cash sales without reporting these sales either in its financial filings or those done by his group companies. So far, the department has identified such cash sales to the tune of 99 crore rupees and suspects that this number could rise by around 250 crore rupees. While various investigative wings of the Revenue Department continue to investigate the alleged fraud perpetrated by Nirav Modi, the IT department, on the other hand, is digging deeper to assess the role of other group companies which might be involved in the suspected fraud, that is, uh, that is Gitanjali Gems, India and their promoter Mehul Choksi. While CNBC TV18 also learns that between the 17th and the 19th of February, the IT department has attached seven properties belonging to uh, Mehul Choksi and Gitanjali Gems and Jili India in Mumbai itself. Out of these seven properties, four belongs to Gitanjali Gems, one belongs to Jili India, and two belong to Mehul Choksi, and all are in Mumbai itself. The tax department on the 17th of February is also learned to have attached nine bank accounts that belong to Choksi and his son. These accounts are at various banks and branches across Mumbai. Sources say that while a few of these are dormant accounts, some have zero balance. 
The rest include a Geetanjali Gems account with 2.29 crore rupees in it, two accounts held by Mehul Choksi with a total balance of around 38 lakh rupees, one in the name of Nakshatra World with a balance of 33.93 lakh rupees, and one in the name of Gili India with a balance of 40.18 lakh rupees. Sources say that more such action can be expected over the course of the next few days as the multiple investigations into the fraud at Punjab National Bank gather steam. With Tim C. Jaipuria in New Delhi, in Mumbai, Arundhati Ramanan. Well, the plot thickens and the regulatory net has widened. Meanwhile, government has also swung into action. The government has raised concerns over RBI's fraud prevention network, raising some serious questions. It is written now to the central bank asking why the PNB fraud went undetected. For more on that, Sapna Das joins in with the very latest on that story. So, Sapna, help us understand the five counts on which the government has sought a response and how soon can we get one? Probably the government is trying to find out whether the banking regulator has failed in its role in terms of detecting the PNB fraud. Uh, the communication uh, entails uh, questions raised uh, to the RBI on five counts. Basically, they want to know, the government wants to know if there have been lapses in terms of the regulatory, supervisory, auditory issues, uh, powers inspection of branches, including the overseas branches, and also cyber security related issues. So the government wants to know from Reserve Bank of India whether, there have been any, whether they have noticed any lapses on these five accounts. And if yes, they should be reported to the government. Well, uh, we have been given to understand that the Reserve Bank of India will may come back to the government after it has done its due diligence with the banks involved. The government is also very clear about the fact that the regulatory and supervisory role rests squarely with the Reserve Bank of India. Uh, you know, they are empowered under the Act. Uh, probably uh, all this is pointing to the fact that the government is trying to, you know, kind of raise a question mark whether RBI has failed or not. Uh, it remains to be seen how this uh, really goes forward. But just a quick point, in every public sector bank, for example, there is an RBI nominee as well as a government nominee. So it remains to be seen how this really goes forward. Thanks a lot, Sapna, for that. Let's continue with that question of accountability with respect to the regulatory framework. In fact, for more on this, uh, we're now joined by R.K. Bakshi. He's the former executive director of Bank of Baroda. And Lata Venkatesh is with us to take us through that conversation. Lata, over to you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Ashmit. And good evening to you, Mr. Bakshi, for joining us. Uh, well, uh, we don't have the actual letter at hand, but uh, we have been briefed by uh, very senior people in the finance ministry. And what we understand is that the Department of Financial Services uh, has sent the letter and they have sought the RBI's view on the lapses in the banking system. And they've asked the RBI to explain the shortcomings in the system. Does it look like an instance of pulling up the Reserve Bank, Mr. Bakshi? No, I don't think so. Is it not very normal that uh, both government and RBI are privy to some information mm -hmm. and some uh, different roles? It's very normal that government, as government of the country, will, and uh, not only as owner of a bank, will definitely like to be briefed on uh, uh, what transpired because RBI should better know being a banking related entity mm. as to and uh, being a regulator they should better know it's very normal that uh, there will be exchange of communication okay. between the two bodies okay no our colleague reporting on the matter says that the government has asked rbi if there have been lapses uh, i mean where are the loopholes in regulatory supervisory auditory inspections and cyber security you know, the word regulatory means whether there have been lapses in regulation. Uh, does that look like an accusation? I would not say that because uh, RBI is a regulator. Mm. So naturally, they will ask whether uh, in the regulatory prescription there are any gaps mm. or was it, an op uh, was it on the implementation side or on the regulation side? Okay. See, regulation is laying down policy. Mm. Supervision is seeing to it whether the policy is being followed. Mm. So naturally, government will ask whether there are any gaps in the regulation. Mm. That means in the policy or in the implementation of that policy. Okay. Where are the gaps? So this is not accusation. I think okay. it's, it's just normal exchange of information. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bakshi, from what is known in the public domain about uh, the lack of uh, connection between the uh, swift communication system and the core banking system of uh, uh, Punjab National Bank, uh, does it look, uh, whose lapse does it look like? 
Uh, is it just a local branch level lapse or are there several layers of lapse? It's uh, very difficult to say uh, that because I, we do not know whether uh, the see ultimately if uh, CBS system was not linked to to the SWIFT, mm. it, it's a bank level issue. Okay. The bank, uh, not a branch level issue. Mm. It's a bank level issue. Maybe the technology when they adopted mm. the core banking, mm. the version that they had, it did not provide for connectivity with SWIFT. Okay. So maybe they might have planned to do it in the next upgrade or whatever. Okay. Okay. But as of that time, it was not there. Okay. So it's definitely not a branch level issue. And at the bank level also, maybe it was a question of the availability of that technology mm. and the See, ultimately, everybody has upgraded the technology stage-wise and mm. how they have been available. Fair point. So, yeah, but Mr. Bakshi, you know, in, a, in two separate speeches, uh, former Deputy Governor Mundra had uh, told the banks, uh, you know, that uh, the SWIFT uh, system needs to be linked to uh, the core banking system. Uh, do you think that uh, to that extent the Reserve Bank had directed or do you think it should have been uh, uh, actually a directive from the Reserve Bank, and to that extent it, it could be a lapse. No, see, I will not call it that. The speech, uh, speeches and articles provide a much wider forum to bring issues into the public domain and knowledge and for discussion purposes. Mm. Uh, to the extent that it was by the DG of the RBI, it reflected uh, some appreciation by, of recent events and therefore an evaluation mm. that the systems need to be perfected even more than they existed at that time. Mm. Mm. Now, whether after that a direction was issued or not, but it was an alertness. And okay. even after that, if any bank would have taken it as uh, um, a very uh, uh, a message to be truly followed mm. for their own uh, betterment in risk management, it will take Time um, to uh, bring uh, uh, the SWIFT and that connectivity because okay. you will have to find whether your present version of CBS permits that or you need an okay. upgrade okay. and how ready the technology providers are for that. Fair. I do not know mm. when, whether and what action was taken by PNB or not mm. and whether any regulatory direction was issued after okay. the speech by RBI. Okay. Those things are not known to us. Okay. But uh, uh, from what is available again in the public domain, uh, would it have been possible at all for an RBI inspection team to catch this lapse? I will think that, uh, again, uh, RBI auditors uh, definitely know their role better. But I think from the limited knowledge that I have, RBI, uh, I don't know whether Brady uh, House branch was inspected, number mm. one, mm. by RBI auditors. Okay. And if it was, many times for many operational matters, they will depend upon the okay. internal audit reports of the branch and okay. the other uh, audit reports of the branch because they may not have the regulate uh, sorry audit bandwidth and time to go into mm. all small things okay so i will add to it that we ultimately it did not come to the notice of the board or anybody immediately because mm. no signals were thrown in the balance sheet or anywhere mm. so this was a bit difficult Mm. It should have been, uh, perhaps if it was in the PNB system to match the swift messages mm. or if the internal audit had pointed out this gap that they are not, this is not okay. being done, it would have come to RBI's notice in okay. the inspection, but then RBI can better comment on it. All right, of course, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bakshi, for joining us. The key takeaway from Mr. Bakshi, this is a branch level and a bank level failure. Uh, probably the internal auditors would have been better placed to point to uh, the bank that uh, uh, you know you don't have a counter signature or a, a counter check on some of the uh, processes but uh, as uh, 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 mr bakshi says a letter from the finance ministry to the reserve bank can be more explanatory asking for an explanation and advice on how to tackle this and where are the lapses need not necessarily be a case of passing the buck that's the word from mr bakshi back to you ashmit right. All right, Lata, many thanks for joining in with that conversation. Well, it's not just the scam at the Punjab National Bank that is under the scanner. The promoter of Protomac Pence to Vikram Kothari has now been charged by the CBI for defaulting on loans worth 800.
100 crore rupees. While Kotari has been arrested, officials have raided three addresses belonging to him in Kanpur. That's not all. Enforcement Directorate has also swung into action. They've registered a case against Kotari under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act. Sources telling us that the other directors of the company, Sadhana and Rahul Kotari, are also named as co-accused. So the Rotomac promoter is now under the scanner. Let's get you all the latest from the markets and what a day this has been. A last hour rally saw markets trim losses, but it wasn't enough to stop benchmark indices from ending below the 100-day moving average. Nifty opened lower and continued to fall as the session progressed, but saw short covering at 10,300 to end below the 10,400 mark. You can see the numbers there on your screen in the sea of red there. The Sensex closed more than 200 points in the red. The mid caps also underperformed, ending with cuts of more than a percent. The Nifty Bank managed to end above the 25,000 mark. That was the only saving grace. Well, on to a very special discussion here. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says his nation is certainly interested in pursuing trade talks with India and with talks of potential for exponential growth in Indo-Canadian trade. In his conversation with CNBC TV8 and Shireen Bhan at a town hall with IIM Ahmedabad students, Justin Trudeau spoke about a whole host of issues, starting from feminism, protectionism, immigration and NAFTA. Interestingly, he also said there is a lot in common between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and President Donald Trump. Here's a slice of that conversation. Is the fact that there is no bilateral protection agreement in place holding back economic ties, uh, do you believe that post this visit we could see more momentum on the FTA deliberations that have been underway? Give me a sense of what we should realistically expect on the economic front. Uh, we are, are certainly very interested in, in uh, pursuing trade negotiations uh, uh, with a broad range of countries, including India. I mean, Canada has successfully, over the past years, at a time where uh, trade deals have fallen out of favor and anti-globalization movements and worries about trade are, are rampant around the world, we successfully concluded a free trade deal with Europe, uh, which is a market of 500 million people. We still have and will continue to have NAFTA, uh, which is a, a trade deal with uh, U.S. and Mexico. We just signed on to the CPTPP, uh, which uh, captures uh, you know, some of the largest uh, and fastest growing economies in, in Asia. Not the largest, but uh, some, of the, some of the fastest growing. Uh, and we're always looking for more. We've got uh, trade deals with South America. Canada knows and Canadians know that trade is conducive to growth. So we're always excited to talk about trade opportunities and we're respectful of the pace and the concerns that uh, uh, our partners will have. We'll never force a trade deal, but uh, we're always eager to talk about deepening our opportunities. Right now, Canada-India trade is about $8 billion a year, which is great uh, in goods, uh, another $2 billion in, in services. But we do $2 billion worth of trade every single day with the United States. So there's a lot of room to grow, even given distances as a challenge. And when you think of the natural connections between Canada and India, obviously there's lots of really good business ties, uh, trades and agricultural uh, products. Uh, Canada creates uh, a tremendous number of, produces a tremendous number of pulses, for example, which is a discussion we're busy having with uh, the Indian government right now where there's uh, slight challenges. But there's so much more to do, and for us, the greatest potential of trade is the people-to-people -people connections. We have 125,000 uh, in, uh, Indian students uh, in our universities uh, every single year. We want to do much more. Uh, India is the number one source of uh, foreign students in, in, sorry, number two source of foreign students in Canada, but definitely on track to being number one, perhaps even later this year if the trend line continues. Uh, Gujarat itself is about, uh, uh, is a significant proportion uh, of that. I think the top three, maybe the top two uh, destination within India, uh, source within India. So there are lots of great people to people ties. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour Plus. Let's get you a special report from NASCOM's India Leaderships Forum that's taking place in Hyderabad. Here's that special. Have a look for yourself. It's the 26th edition of the NASCOM India Leadership Forum. Annual break from tradition NASCOM has held it along with the World Congress on Information Technology in Hyderabad. It began with quite the bank. Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself addressing all the 2,500 delegates 
from New Delhi and then the Information Technology Minister Ravi Shankar Prasad actually speaking at that keynote session. But uh, let's first look at the exclusive conversations with CNBC TV 18. Here's Rishad Premji, the Vice Chairman of NASCOM and Chief Strategy Officer of Wipro, as well as Tech Mahindra CP Gurnani. There are signs that overall global economy is only looking better in practically all parts of the world and uh, which effectively means is that we can see more digital spending we can start looking at uh, better uh, you know consumption not only on digital technologies but also on the changes that many organizations have been planning CP, uh, you have said that you want to double your uh, digital revenues based on the kind of momentum and the uh, traction that you're seeing from clients. Uh, you're at 24% right now. Uh, by when would you be able to double this? Is, is, is 2020, 2021 a realistic target? So there's a good word in English which said tomorrow, when then tomorrow <laughs> never comes. <laughs> so uh, I'm not, uh, I'm just kidding. But I mean, ultimately, what we are talking about is Internally, our plan is to take the digital revenue up to 60% of our, biz uh, our business. So that's more uh, than doubling from the uh, current. In business. three years. Trouble area that, uh, uh, that seem to be there, be it uh, uh, US, be it uh, uh, the fact that BFSI continues to remain volatile, even though you have been able to outperform your peers in in couple of quarters in the last one year. Um, do you see the US and BFSI seeing a recovery in FY19? Again, BFSI, when you start, I mean, it, uh, every sector, we, and in Tech Mahindra, we classified and studied 17 sectors mm. in huge detail. Mm. And we looked at the influence of existing companies, mm. uh, looked at the influence of new age companies, mm. we looked at the convergence of mm. a company like a WhatsApp coming into a uh, mobile wallet uh, or uh, Amazon getting into, uh, you know, but manufacturing. I want to ask you about this. So what, what do you think would the, would so the, 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 the WhatsApp pay, Amazon, uh, branching out into various areas, will this disrupt the Indian IT services sector as is? I think Indian IT will benefit out of all of this. All of it. That's why I said the classification has to be three. Okay. The, the new age companies, the companies which are up. Uh, you know, into convergence, mm. or the third thing is which are traditional players. Mm. And all three of us, the, them, I mean, ultimately need technology to be able to mm. be the challengers, be the innovators, mm. or be the disruptors. Okay. And as long as we understand what their requirements are, I think we will do well. So this is terrific. I mean, this is the first time we're doing it along with WCIT and WITSA uh, in Hyderabad. It usually happens in Mumbai and we have over 2,500 people, almost 2,500 people attending. So it's been a terrific show and you've seen the morning kick off, which has been great. And looking forward to the discussions, I think it's very focused on the new world, on, on digital, on new skills, on new technologies and how we as a country can leverage that and grow with that in its next phase of growth for the technology industry in India. Well, Richard, if I can ask you, this year was slightly muted as far as, you know, export growth was concerned. And even IT spending, we've seen FY18 be a little bit of a, you know, struggle. But FY19, even the Gartner report indicates it's going to pick up. What is the outlook as far as the IT sector is concerned in coming year? So you'll have to wait for that. We have a meeting tomorrow afternoon with the press, so you'll have a better sense for what last year should look like, next year should look like. But this year look is very much in line with what we had guided last year. We had guided 7 to 8 percent. Mm -hmm. And so it should be broadly in line along those lines and you know uh, the economy in the world are picking up I mean you, you've never seen the world more positive uh, now at this point in time mm -hmm. than it ever has been you look at the US you look at Europe you look at even Japan sure. and so I'm quite optimistic about what that bodes in terms of spend on technology as we move into next year so hopefully we can have a good conversation tomorrow as well. One final question we're seeing AI automation you know blockchain technology those are the buzzwords as far as you are concerned what are the key uh, you know themes that will be the focus point of this year's uh, conference? You no, know, I think it's all about new technologies, right? And I think it's really about how those come together.
together uh, and, and confluence to create impact. You know, with so much change in the world, with the fact that the world has truly become a mobile first, a cloud first world, it's become so much more data rich that is getting more and more organized in terms of data. I think that creates huge opportunities for how organizations now go to market, how they address both their customers as well as their employees. So I think it's a confluence of these technologies that will have an impact. But now it's time to throw the spotlight onto the global giants. We're going to hear from Shantan Narayan of Adobe to Paul Achmalan of Capgemini as well as David Koot of Honeywell, all betting big on India. Listen We actually did announce that as a result of uh, the reduced corporate tax that uh, our earnings would uh, grow quite substantially in 20. Uh, 18 and then continue to uh, have a lower tax rate I think will just continue to improve uh, American competitiveness. The other thing we also announced was that we would be uh, bringing back the money that we had offshore and that would again allow us to invest in innovation and continued growth for Adobe. The company, uh, Shireen, is focused primarily on long-term growth and access to capital was something that Adobe had even prior to this repatriation. We've had a long history of uh, stock buybacks as a way of uh, continuing to return uh, excess capital to shareholders and uh, you know I think investing in uh, technologies like AI and mobile that we think will continue to drive future growth is also top of mind in terms of our agenda. Well first I think we're in rarefied atmosphere in that when you look at a company like Adobe and what we are seeing on top line growth what we are seeing with respect to uh, bottom line growth at a very substantial margin I think you know we're a very unique uh, position. I think in terms of you know potential concerns that might exist we look at uh, the two key imperatives for the company, namely empowering people to create and helping businesses transform and think that they represent tailwinds for many years because that innate desire for whether you're an individual user or whether you're an enterprise to tell your story digitally and the need for companies to determine whether digital is going to be a tailwind or headwind we don't think is impacted by the economy. So we'll continue to monitor the economy, but we think that both of the businesses that we have are so fundamental to how individuals and businesses transform that as long as we continue to innovate, we'll see good growth. We would love to find uh, technology companies that are innovating. I think as the evolution of the industry in India continues, uh, services are still where there's a tremendous opportunity in terms of talent, but the product innovation in a fundamental way in the areas that are critical for us, namely digital media and digital marketing. Uh, there are none, unfortunately, that are on my radar. With respect to the entrepreneurship that we are seeing, I think the entrepreneurship in India is not in the areas that are uh, critical to Adobe's growth, uh, namely analytics, what we are doing with AI, what we are doing around augmented reality and virtual reality. To your question, though, in the U.S., uh, sometimes valuations have got ahead of themselves. Uh, but, you know, I, if it's the right technology and the right people, we will still, uh, you know, continue to be aggressive about looking at it. We bought some really interesting companies last year that are going to be the basis of some new products that we deliver this year. But, and so we're constantly looking, but even the organic opportunity at Adobe is so large right now. As long as we continue to deliver against that innovation, we feel very confident about uh, where Adobe is headed. Dave, thanks very much for joining us on CNBC TV 18. It's always good to have you on the program. Uh, before I talk to you about technology and disruptions, let me ask you about the big tax cut announced by President Trump in America and what the impact is likely to be on corporate America and also U.S. companies operating in emerging markets like India. Do you foresee significant restructuring of operations? Uh, what is the impact of the tax cuts on business? Oh, I think the uh, tax cut overall is going to be beneficial, uh, not just for business, but for all the people that are employed by uh, businesses. Uh, so I think it's actually going to be a good phenomenon. I don't think it really has an impact on international trade in any way or uh, movement of factories one way or the other. This is uh, just a case of putting more money in the pockets of companies for them to be able to invest. And if they invest more, then employees will do uh, better. And I would say it's pretty much as straightforward as that. Uh, I do worry about the long-term effect of it mm -hmm. in terms of the impact it has on our overall debt. Our annual deficits are going to increase. Our debt, which is already high, is going to get higher. 
Uh, it could accelerate a potential debt crisis. But at least in the short term, it should be a boost. It should be a boost to the U.S. economy, which should be helpful to the world. Uh, in the short term, you expect the U.S. economy to benefit from the tax cuts, Dave. How confident do you feel of the growth momentum that we're currently seeing in the U.S. being able to sustain itself? Oh, I think uh, economic growth in the U.S. should be in that, my guess, 2.5% range. For, uh, could go on for another four or five years. Uh, this year might be a little higher because of the tax cut impact. But over time, it's tough to see right now, other than some big geopolitical event, what could possibly bring it down. So exciting times these for the IT industry with uh, technologies such as blockchain, uh, such as artificial intelligence at a more local level, the entry of WhatsApp uh, as far as mobile wallet is concerned. Shireen, Kritika and Nitya, they're getting us a complete wrap of the NASCOM Leadership Summit in touch uh, with the biggest names uh, in the space. On that note, let's slip into a very short break. But up next, there's no respite in sight for Fortis Healthcare promoters. Delhi High Court bars them from selling any assets. More details on the other side. Despite insight for Fortis Healthcare promoters Malvinder and Shivinder Singh, the Delhi High Court today directed the brothers to maintain status quo as far as their assets are concerned. The High Court was hearing Daichi's plea seeking execution of the 3,500 crore arbitral award. High Court has also restrained the brothers from selling or even creating third party rights over their assets and shareholding. The court has also directed the Singh brothers to submit a payment plan as far as the arbitral award is concerned, no later than the 26th of February. And it doesn't end there. According to a senior official, the Serious Fraud Investigation Office will be initiating a probe into alleged financial irregularities at Fortis Healthcare as well as regular Religare Enterprises. The Corporate Affairs Ministry had been looking into the affairs of both these companies after recent reports of irregularities emerged at both fronts. So things not looking good there for the Singh brothers. But Ashmit, the big investment summit this time from Maharashtra. Indeed, and big numbers is what we're talking about. 10 lakh crores is what the Maharashtra government is aiming at in terms of commitments from India, Inc. In fact, uh, today was day two of uh, the Magnetic Maharashtra Summit. So far, close to 5 lakh crore rupees worth of memorandums of understanding have been signed. Uh, the Maharashtra government summit is aiming at an investment commitment of at least 10 lakh crore rupees. Uh, the memorandum of understanding signed today include those with the likes of uh, Virgin Hyperloop 1, uh, Mahindra and Mahindra, and renew power. In fact, uh, Priya Sheth and Ritu Singh uh, bring us this special report from Ground Zero. Well, it's been an action-packed day two here at the Magnetic Maharashtra Summit. In fact, some of the key sessions that dominated the agenda this time around included renewables, the EV push infrastructure, as well as smart cities. In fact, the state is hoping to receive investment commitments of close to 10 to 12 lakh crore rupees. Absolutely, Priya. A very ambitious target that the state has set for itself. In fact, Chief Minister Devendra Fadnavis says the, uh, the target really is to create a $1 trillion economy for the state of Maharashtra and several uh, important MOUs were signed today itself. These include Tata Power committing at about 15,500 crore rupees, Renew Power 14,000 crore rupees, Virgin Hyperloop 40,000 crore rupees, Credai Maharashtra another 1 lakh crore rupees. So uh, while all of this really has to translate into investments, we spoke to a lot of corporates about this and here's what they had to say. We have uh, uh, committed to invest 400 crores in Karnataka and 500 crores in Maharashtra over the next uh, three or five years, uh, whereby we'll increase the capacity from the current capacity of about 400 vehicles a month to about 4,000 vehicles a month over five years. Right now, we have about 400 megawatts of wind in the state, which is a total investment of close to 3,000 crores. So we're actually already probably the largest renewable energy investor in the state of Maharashtra. Uh, and it's a fairly sizable investment that we have here. Um, going forward, we are going to be signing an MOU today with the government of Maharashtra for further investments of about 2,500 megawatts in the state uh, over the next five years. some stage, the Reserve Bank has to come with a new system mm. and you cannot simultaneously continue all the old systems which are going on mm. for resolution for bad NPAs. Yeah. There were so many different schemes apart from CDR and 
uh, GLF and different different schemes were there. Mm. When you start something new, when NCLT has been formed, what is the purpose of NCLT? Mm. So at some stage you have to cut off and Reserve Bank has cut off, which has upset some people because many companies and banks were on finalization of scheme. Mm. But Reserve Bank also has to take a view. They can't let five schemes continue at the same time. But then they may increase the NPA, but it cleans, uh, cleanses the system. Now that NPAs have come out, let us let us once and for all clean up the system. I think the opportunity to grow and serve the nation's housing needs are very large. They could be in affordable housing as we're doing in a very large scale, including Palawa, Upper Thane, Mara, and other locations, and they can be in different parts of the city. We will look at opportunities uh, based on where we are short of land, uh, but we think that the market will continue to be solid for quality players like us. What we've simply said is, what's the other way that you could get from Pune to Mumbai? And our prices should be the same. They should take into consideration the time, the fuel, the energy. You have to remember we're all electric, yeah. so we're going to reduce emissions in the region and improve the environment. But the ticket prices will be those equivalent to the other forms of transportation. And then when you do that, it's proven around the world that if you have a ticket price that's affordable, then people will choose that mode of transportation. It will become the norm. And we could see potentially 10,000 passengers an hour moving in each direction on this very exciting Hyperloop. We're, we're investing a lot in trying to um, uh, bring uh, Hyperloop, which is going to be running at 1,000 kilometers an hour, uh, to different cities. How much would you invest? Oh, it'll be, uh, well, many, many, many millions. Well, Priya, tomorrow is going to be the grand finale of this three-day-long Magnetic Maharashtra Summit. Of course, an important day to watch out for. Absolutely. In fact, stay tuned to CNBC TV 18 for all the latest news updates with regards to Magnetic Maharashtra in Mumbai with Ritu Singh Priya Shet. All right, time for us to slip into another break. But when we return, if you're looking to buy a new smartphone, we'll tell you all about Xiaomi's latest gadgets on the other side and then you can decide for yourself. Welcome back. Now, if you're looking for a good and affordable mid-range smartphone with good build and performance, Xiaomi might have the answer for you. CNBC TV 18's Mega Vishwanath tells us all about the company's two new offerings. Take a look. This year on Valentine's Day, Chinese electronics maker Xiaomi decided to give its Indian fans a gift. The Redmi Note 5 and the Redmi Note 5 Pro. While the two might look like twins, if you look at their front panel, Flip it around and you'll know what makes one superior than the other. The Redmi Note 5 is the successor of the popular Redmi Note 4. This upgrade packs in a bigger, brighter 5.99-inch display with much thinner bezels. In terms of the software, the layout stays true to Redmi Note devices with MIUI 9 that runs on Android 7.1. Under its hood, it packs in Qualcomm Snapdragon 625 octa-core processor, 4000 mAh battery that lasts over a day on a single charge. Speaking of the camera, the Redmi Note 5 sports a 12-megapixel rear and a 5-megapixel front camera which produces moderately good results. Alright, so the Redmi Note 5 is available in two variants. The 3GB plus 32GB internal storage will cost you 9,999 rupees while the 4GB plus 64GB variant will set you back by 11,999 rupees. Now, the Redmi Note 5 is not the most appealing smartphone if what you really care about is looks. But it is sturdy and it will get your work done. Now, let's talk pro. What makes this a more enhanced version is the newer processor, bigger RAM, bigger front camera and a dual camera rear setup. Looks familiar or at least reminds you of a certain flagship? Hint, it's bezel-less and packs in a vertical dual rear camera setup. Moving on, Xiaomi, also known as the Apple of China, no pun intended, has globally launched the Redmi Note 5 Pro in India. This device is pure power in its price category. This phone marks the global debut of Qualcomm Snapdragon 636 processor, which has been clubbed with up to 6 GB of RAM. Its 12 megapixel rear camera is easily one of the best in its segment. It also shows off a 20 megapixel front camera along with LED flash. 
Xiaomi is now planning to throw in a face unlock by March end 2018. The only thing missing is a USB Type-C port. But if you're still sold, the 4GB variant will cost you 13,999 rupees, going up to 16,999 rupees for the 6GB RAM variant. To sum it up, let me put it this way: the Redmi Note 5 Pro is the new award-winning hero in the sub 20k mid-range segment. It checks all the right boxes for a casual user who's looking for form, function, and is on a budget. Our Tech Toys verdict is that the Pro is a definite buy. That's it in this edition of Tech Toys. My name is Megha Vishwanath. I'll see you next time. So, Ashmit, are you willing to trade your old phone for the Xiaomi one? <laughs> I'll wait maybe for the new iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, we're going to wrap up this edition of India Business South. Many thanks for watching from all of us here. Good night, and we'll be back tomorrow.